Lectures on the Basics of Biblical Greek Chapter 21 As this chapter begins a new semester, we start with a major review. We have been looking at the Greek verb, the most important word in the Greek sentence, and have learned previously that there are five major tenses in Koine Greek, the present, imperfect, future, aorist, and perfect. We have looked at two of those tenses, the present and the future. When tense is combined with voice, there are seven combinations. There is the present tense, the imperfect tense, the future active, the aorist active, perfect active, perfect passive, and aorist passive. These tense voice combinations yield six principal parts for the Greek verb. The present, future active, aorist active, perfect active, perfect middle passive, and the aorist passive. Again, we have focused on the present and the future today. Key for translating a Greek indicative verb is to notice the personal ending. Whereas English uses extra words to indicate person and number, it's all part of the Greek verb. For presents and futures, the primary active or primary middle passive set of endings are used. So, for example, the present active indicative is formed by combining the present stem, a connecting vowel, omicron or epsilon, plus the primary active endings, yielding leo, lies, lie, Leomen, Leata, Leusi. And translated, I destroy, you singular dis destroy, he, she, or it destroys, we are destroying, you plural are destroying, they are destroying. The present middle passive is formed similarly with a present stem, a connecting vowel, and a personal ending, but in this case it's the primary middle passive endings, my, si, tai, methus, the, n, tai, that are added to uh, give the form. And so we have li, am, I, I am being destroyed, li, a, you singular are being destroyed, li, te, he, she, or it is being destroyed, li, amatha, we are being destroyed, li, astha, you plural are being destroyed, and li, on, tai, they are being destroyed. The future active is formed by using the future active tense stem. In Leo, it's identical to the present. A tense formative, the sigma that you see highlighted, plus a connecting vowel and a primary ending. So, liso, I shall destroy. Lises, you singular, will destroy. Lise, he, she, or it will destroy. Lisum, Lisamen, we will, shall destroy. Lisate, you plural, will destroy. Lisusi, they will destroy. Liquid futures are verbs where the future stem ends in a mu, nu, lambda, or rho. In those four cases, the uh, tense formative is not a sigma, but an epsilon sigma. The sigma then drops out and the epsilon combines with the connecting vowel in a manner very similar to an epsilon contract. The difference is the tense stem. Liquid futures are a future tense stem where epsilon contracts are on a present tense stem. So, meno, I, shall, remain, and so forth. The last item we discussed before the semester break was the connection between roots and stems. The root is the most basic form of a verb. The stem is the most basic form in a particular uh, pattern, such as present stem, future stem, aorist stem. Many roots yield all the stems. However, the root may undergo some changes in forming the stems. 
This is particularly true of the present, where, for example, the root bal, which means to throw, adds another lambda when it forms the present, but it doesn't in the future or the aorist. Some words have more than one root, and a particular root can yield a particular stem, such as the verb erkomai, I come or go, has two roots, erk, behind erkomai, eleuth, which is behind eleusomai, and, yes, it's also behind aelthon, the aorist form. With this simple review of um, the present and futures, which we've learned in the previous semester, we now turn our attention to what English calls past time. But we'll note that Greek is more concerned with type of action, and so there are two past tenses in Greek. We'll consider that distinction first, and then move on to the imperfect, which is the primary focus of this lesson. First of all, the two past tenses. As I said, Greek focuses on type of action, not time. So the imperfect tense describes ongoing action. It's a type of action that happens to take place in the past. She was running. The present is ongoing action in the present. The imperfect ongoing action in the past. But notice in both cases it's the type of action that's most critical. The aorist tense, which we'll learn in a future lesson, is more undefined action in the past. It's quite sim similar to the English past tense. She ran, although the aorist can have other uh, connotations. The important point is aorist does not describe any particular type of action it's undefined action in the past. How does one recognize past tenses such as the imperfect and the aorist? Past tenses have augments and past tenses use secondary endings. Again, past tenses have augments and past tenses use secondary endings. Chapter 21 focuses on one of these two past tenses, the imperfect, which describes ongoing action in the past. The imperfect is formed by putting together four parts, an augment plus the present stem, so the imperfect is built on the present, a connecting vowel, omicron or epsilon, and then a secondary ending four pieces. So now in addition to looking at the end of the verb and the middle of the verb, we have to look at the beginning of the verb in order to correctly parse its forms. The verb is the most important word in the Greek sentence. The secondary active endings are in order nu, sigma, nothing, to which an movable nu is often added, men, te, and nu. So first singular, second singular, third singular, first plural, second plural, third plural. Notice the first singular and the third plural are identical in form. So it will be the context, the presence of a first person pronoun or a nominative plural in the sentence that will help us distinguish the forms. The middle column of this chart shows well the four pieces that go together to form the imperfect. The augment in green, present stem in white, connecting vowel in yellow, personal ending in blue. So the first person singular, Elion, I was destroying. Elias, you singular were destroying. Elia, or Elien, he, she, or it was destroying. First person plural, Eliamen, we were destroying. Eliate, you plural, were destroying. Elion, 
they were destroying. Again, notice, first singular and third plural are identical in form. As you might guess, the imperfect middle passive is formed similarly. It just uses a different set of personal endings. Again, the forming of the imperfect is augment, present stem, connecting vowel, and secondary ending. But with the imperfect middle passive, we are concerned about secondary middle passive endings. And those endings are main, saw, ta, metha, st, and nta. First singular, second singular, third singular, first plural, second plural, third plural, in order. When appended to the other forms, these secondary middle passive endings give us the imperfect middle passive. Notice the four parts, augment, stem, connecting vowel, ending. Let's look at each of the forms in turn. Eliamain, first person singular, I was, and this is passive now, being destroyed. The second person singular, Eliu looks a little odd because the actual personal ending is saw, but the sigma drops out and epsilon plus omicron contract together to form u, thus the form Eliu, meaning u singular, were being destroyed. Eliata, he, she, or it, was being destroyed. Eliamatha, we were being destroyed. Eliasta, you plural were being destroyed. Elianta, they were being destroyed. We've said all along that one of the identifying marks of the imperfect is an augment. We'll also find augments on aorist forms. The difference, of course, is the stem used. Imperfect uses a present stem. Aorist uses the aorist stem. But what exactly is an augment? First of all, augments occur on verbs that indicate past times. So we'll have augments on imperfects and aorist. The actual form of the augment, though, depends on whether the verb begins with a consonant, a vowel, or a preposition. Let's look at each of those cases. If the verb begins with a consonant, an epsilon with a smooth breathing mark is added to the front of the present stem. So the present stem li begins with a consonant, an epsilon is added. The stem blep begins with a consonant, an epsilon is added. The stem leg begins with a consonant, an epsilon is added. If the verb begins with a consonant, it's augmented by adding an epsilon to the front. On the other hand, if a verb begins with a single vowel, the augment is formed by lengthening the vowel. For example, akuo lengthens the vowel to form the imperfect akuon. The uh, present erkomai, the lead epsilon, is lengthened to an eta, forming the imperfect erkomain. And a slightly different way of doing it is visible with echo, where the epsilon is lengthened to a diphthong to form the imperfect akon. So, we have two ways of forming augments, adding an epsilon to a stem that begins with a consonant, or lengthening the vowel of a stem that begins with a single vowel. But then there are stems that begin with diphthongs, more than one vowel. And here, there is some irregularity. Either 
the first letter of the diphthong is lengthened, or the diphthong just appears unchanged, and it's irregular as to when this occurs. So, eucharisteo, the verb for giving thanks, lengthens the initial epsilon to form the imperfect. But heurisco, which also begins with the same diphthong, when it forms the imperfect, does not lengthen the epsilon. Nonetheless, one can clearly see that heuriscon is an imperfect because the ending is secondary, not primary. A couple of other odd examples here. Alpha plus iota will sometimes augment to eta with iota subscript. Same with epsilon iota. And omicron iota will augment to omega with iota subscript. There aren't many verbs that begin with diphthongs, but they can be somewhat difficult um, because of some irregularities. A third major occur, case occurs if a verb begins with a prefix, that is, for example, a preposition added to the front of the verb. In that case, the augmentation sneaks in between the prefix and actually augments the stem. So, proskineo, you see that that verb begins with the prefix, pros, so the epsilon follows the pros. Apostello, the verb to send. Again, one sees a uh, preposition at the beginning, apa, and so the epsilon sneaks in after the apa, actually taking out the omicron, and so the imperfect is a pestelon, I was sending. And in some cases, that epsilon that sneaks between the preposition, the, the prefix, and the stem can actually change the preposition. So, ek balo, notice how the epsilon sneaks in, but it causes the kappa to become a xi for smoothness in enunciation. Exebalon is easier to pronounce than ekebalon. It avoids stopping the airflow. But in all these cases, the augmentation occurs between the prefix, which is a preposition, and the main stem. So before we uh, practice some translating, let's review the personal ending chart to date. In this particular iteration of the chart, I've included the four major quadrants, primary active, primary middle passive, secondary active, and secondary middle passive, and split each of those quadrants in half, showing on the left the actual endings, and showing on the right the ending plus the connecting vowel. You should memorize the endings without the connecting vowel. So for this lesson, secondary actives are nu, sigma, nothing, men, te, nun, and the secondary middle passives are main, sa, ta, mesa, sta, and nta. Notice some similarities to um, the uh, primaries, especially in uh, the first person plural and second person plural, uh, and minor similarities in the middle passives uh, with the uh, tai and ta, ntai and nta the third person forms. This chart must be committed to memory in order to parse indicative verbs. But now you have all the personal endings. So let's practice some translating. Eblepete. Notice the augment. Notice that tau epsilon at the end, you plural were seeing. The augment with a ku amen is formed by lengthening the alpha of a kuo, and notice it has a secondary middle passive ending, 
I was being heard. Elegas, augment, an epsilon, and then the personal ending sigma, secondary ending, you singular, were speaking. Notice how the augment has snuck in between the P of the apa and the sigma of the stello, the stel root. The form, though, with an on ending, a new ending, could either be first person singular or third person plural. So the bare form can be translated I was sending or they were sending. Context will determine which. It actually is. And li u, behind that u, is the epsilon sigma omicron, saw. U singular were being destroyed. Second person singular, imperfect indicative passive. Ed dinata, again the augment, indicating uh, with a present stem that we have an imperfect. He, she, or it was able. The patterns introduced in this lesson, of course, also apply to contract verbs and a me. I'm going to show you the charts, but you should be able, from the rules you already know, to figure out the parsing if you uncontract the forms. Let's recall the rules of contraction. Rule one, epsilon, omicron, omicron, epsilon, or omicron, omicron, contract to oo. Rule two, double epsilon, contracts to epsilon yoda. Rule three, omicron or omega plus any of the other, any other vowel except those in rule one, contracts to omega. Rule four, Alpha plus epsilon contracts to alpha. Rule five, epsilon plus alpha contracts to eta. And rule six, omicron, epsilon, yoda contracts to omicron, yoda. Look for these rules being applied in the next couple of charts. This chart shows you the inflected forms of the imperfect active of the three major paradigm contract verbs, agapao, Alpha contract, poyao, epsilon contract, and plerao, an uh, omicron contract. For each, I have shown you what the uh, stem vowel is and what the uncontracted form is, alpha plus omicron nu. Therefore, by doing so, you can see the rules being applied. In our first example, in the upper left, Agapon, that's not genitive plural, it's a contraction of alpha plus omicron, according to rule three, becoming omega, and then a new added. So by looking at the various examples, you can take these forms apart. If you know what their contract verb is, and you know what the uh, connecting vowel and personal ending, is, then you can take it apart and figure out which form it is. Same thing holds true with the imperfect middle passives. Let's take the example of the third person singular of play rao, uh, at play runta. It's in the right hand column, the third example down the omicron upsilon contract is formed by the combination of the stem vowel omicron plus the connecting vowel epsilon of the et ta ending. So while these look a little confusing at first, if you remember what the stem vowel is and if you know your personal endings, you can take them apart, see the personal endings, and get the parsing correctly. Your lesson provides one last example of the imperfect. That's our stative verb, a me. Uh, these forms are probably best treated as vocabulary words and just added to your vocabulary list. Please note that there are two different ways of forming the first person imperfect uh, plural 
of ami, either with amen or amatha. Either form can occur. So in this lecture, we've looked at the fact that Greek has two past tenses, which emphasize different aspect or type of action. In this lesson, we have focused on the imperfect active, which conveys ongoing action in the past, as well as the imperfect middle passive. Past tenses are identified by the appearance of augments. We define augments, the three major ways in which they can be formed, either by adding an epsilon, lengthening a lead vowel, sometimes not with diphthongs, or sneaking that augment in between the prefix, often a preposition, and the main stem. We've practiced some translating, and we've looked briefly at contract verbs and a me. So we've begun to build, over the last end of last semester, the beginning of this semester, our master verb chart. Uh, and by the time we're done with the indicatives, it'll be a rather lengthy chart, but this is where we are now, adding the imperfect actives and middle passives in between the presents and the futures because the imperfects are formed on present stems. And the various parts are indicated for you in this chart. That's chapter 21 of the Basics of Biblical Greek.